funeral time because it's, it's probably untrue in every case except for one. And this is one of the things that the longer I'm a Christian, the longer I'm alive, I just stand in awe of about Jesus. He never said an unkind word to anyone. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25, the Bible teaches us to, to take a good look at him and to follow in his steps. Peter puts it this way, For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was any deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but now have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He bore my sins and he bore your sins in his body on the tree, the cross. Why was he qualified to do that? Because he committed no sin. Well, be more specific, Peter. No deceit was found in his mouth. He never told a lie. He never misled anyone. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered unjustly, he did not threaten committed himself to God. Now, I want you to think about the specifics that the Holy Spirit gave Peter to tell us about there. Jesus never sinned. Well, that's an amazing thought. But then especially when Peter enumerates these ways that Jesus could have sinned, that you and I most definitely have sinned. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Jesus never told a lie. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. What's that mean? Well, somebody got verbally violent with him, and he didn't return it. Now, isn't that a tall order? And even when he was suffering at the hands of other people, he made no threats, even though he could have followed up on any threat he would ever have made. How amazing it is that Jesus is like that, that he lived a life like that, and it's because of that that his life could be substituted in death for ours. We want to be like him, don't we? The specific text for our study this morning is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. And I want to challenge you to talk this way. And this maybe is going to become a series of lessons, not all at once here, but talk this way. Specifically this morning, the way it says to talk, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. You believe it, don't you? But do you live by it? A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, I know you believe that because you have seen it work at least occasionally in your life, whether you were the one offering the soft answer or someone did toward you when you were angry. Most of the time, this is going to play out. You'll find it to be the truth. I want to point you to four examples in the Old Testament very quickly, which say this is the way it works. First is in Judges chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. God has called Gideon to be judge, to be deliverer for his people at this one particular juncture. And you'll remember that uh, incredible story where the Midianites are threatening the Israelites 
and God calls Gideon to, to muster men, and, and Gideon does that, and, but tells him, hold on there, that's way too many men. They're, you get a victory here, and, and they're just going to trust in themselves and their own might. We need to narrow this down. And so you remember how God did that until there were only 300 men left to take on this army. And, and then what are we going to do? Well, they gather jars and torches, and they've got their swords, and they've got their trumpets, and they go and do what God says to do, and, and they get the result God said they would get. So it, it, it's winding down, and, and the men who are, who are left that were fighting against them begin to scatter, and some of them go out among where the Ephraimites uh, could get in on things now. But look at Judges chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. The men of Ephraim, now remember that's one of the tribes of Israel. The men of Ephraim said to him, What is this that you have done to us, not to call us when you went to fight with Midian? And they accused him fiercely. What? Their feelings are hurt. They didn't get to fight. Not from the beginning. And they're, more than their feelings being hurt, they are fiercely angry. And so they pour it out with their words on Gideon, the leader. Verse 2, and he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abiazer? That's where Gideon was from. God has given into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What have I been able to do in comparison with you? Then the anger against him subsided when he said this. Now, these men come at Gideon unjustly angry, but he strikes a conciliatory tone. You think you guys are unimportant? Uh, you think the, the place where you live is not productive and, and great? He, he just thinks of a few things he can say to build these people up. He uses that soft answer. And though these men had come to him in fierce anger, the words he said and the way that he said it brought calm. The Bible says, then their anger against him subsided when he said this. It works this way. Now, let's watch it work this way on the flip side by turning your, your Bible just a few pages over to Judges chapter 12. Here's a a very similar situation with a very, very different outcome. And why? It's because this time Jephthah is judge, and instead of with a soft answer, he chooses to respond with a harsh word. Now look who it is again. Judges chapter 12, verse 1. The men of Ephraim were called to arms... And they crossed to Zaphon and said to Jephthah, Why did you cross over to fight against the Ammonites and did not call us to go out with you? Do you hear almost the exact same situation again? And they're fiercely angry again. How angry? Well, it says at the end of verse 1, We will burn your house over you with fire. I wish Gideon had been there. Because watch how it turns out in verse 2. And Jephthah said to them, I and my people had a great dispute with the Ammonites. When I called you, you did not save me from their hand. And when I saw that you would not save me, I took my life in my hand and crossed over against the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. Bear in mind, these are brother Israelites. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites, in the midst of Ephraim and Manasseh. And the Gileadites captured the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. And when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? When he said, No, they said to him, Then say, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth. For he could not pronounce it right. 
Then they seized him and slaughtered him at the fords of Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of the Ephraimites fell. Now, this started out over the Ammonites. The Ammonites were not Israelites. Those were aggressive enemies. Well, Ephraim had not been called from the first to fight. Well, they didn't like being left out of the fight. So they come ready to pick a fight. And Jephthah says, you want to fight? We will fight. 42,000 men ended up dead because of those harsh words. A harsh word stirs up anger. Now, two more examples you'll find on one page in your Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 25. 1 Samuel chapter 25. David and, and his men, David has not gotten to ascend the throne yet, Saul's still around, so David's here and David's there. He's in a vicinity with his men, and being there, he has provided considerable help to the family business of Nabal and Abigail. Now, the Bible tells us in in verse 3 that the name of the man was Nabal and the name of his wife, Abigail, The woman was discerning and beautiful, but the man was harsh and badly behaved. He was a Calebite. Well, David and his men had been providing protection, perhaps other help for Nabal's shepherds. Time for the sheep to be sheared. David and his men could use some help. They could use some sustenance. David has been on the run for a long time from Saul. He doesn't get to be at home and enjoy all the comforts. So he sends some men to ask for help from Nabal. Verse 9, when David's young men came, they said all this to Nabal in the name of David, and then they waited. And Nabal answered, David's servants, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants these days who are breaking away from Uh, their master. Shall I take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shearers and give it to men who come from I did not know where? So David's young men turned away, came back, and told him all this. And David said to his men, Every man strap on his sword. And every man of them strapped on his sword. David also strapped on his sword, and about 400 men went up after David, while 200 remained with the baggage. And what does David intend? Well, after the way that Nabal has spoken to his men, he intends to fight. And it's not going to be pretty. Well, Nabal won't back down. Nabal's wife, Abigail, who's discerning and beautiful, the Bible told us, gets wind of it, and and she goes to work. First of all, she gets some food together for these men. and We're not going to take the time to read the rest of the story, but she comes to David and admitting my husband shouldn't have acted like he acted. He shouldn't have said what he said. And David, you don't want to do this. You don't want to be guilty of this bloodshed. And she has more to say, but but watch the way it turns out then in verse 32. David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. David sees the hand of God's providence involved when he was ready to do something out of anger. In verse 33, Blessed be your discretion, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from blood guilt and from avenging myself with my own hand. For as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, who has restrained me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me truly by morning, there not, had not been left to Nabal so much as one male. And David received from her hand what she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. See, I've obeyed your voice, and I have granted your petition. David was angry. No wonder how glad he was for this woman who would come with this soft answer. You see, we read this proverb And we read these real-life stories in the Bible, and we think about real-life situations these days, and that's right. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. 
Let's think about harsh words for just a moment. Harsh words sometimes are defined by the very terms we use. When we get involved in name-calling, those are harsh words. We use words that are explosive. If we use words that are expletive, those are harsh words. If we use words that are unrealistic, they often take a situation where it wasn't going to go. Almost any time you inject the words always or never or you're just like into a disagreement, it's not going to be over real fast and it might not end very well. Our words are harsh, definitely, when we intend them to cause pain. In Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, the Bible says, There is one whose rash words are like a sword thrust. Sometimes we intend to hurt people with our words. And usually when we intend it to be that way, well, exactly what we intended happens. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 4, just three verses after our text, the Bible says a gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. Sometimes our words are harsh because of the very terms that we use. At other times, it's the tone of the words that we use. Words that might be rather harmless in and of themselves, do something different because of the way in which they are spoken. Uh, Two neighbors were talking over the back fence, and one of them said, I went to a wedding this weekend, but I don't think the marriage will last. His friend said, why would you be thinking that already uh, just after the wedding? He said, well, when the man said, I do, the woman said, don't talk to me in that tone. In marriage, you're going to learn about tone, aren't you? You're going to spend a lifetime learning about tone and the difference that tone makes. Proverbs chapter 29, verse 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. If it's not the very terms that we use, nor even the tone, sometimes it's the timing in what we say that makes words harsh. Uh, Let me soften things for a few moments. There's a story about Mr. Myrick who had to go to Chicago on business. He persuaded his brother to take care of his cat while he was gone uh, for the weekend. Now, his brother did not like cats, but he was doing a favor. So, uh, upon his return, Mr. Myrick called from the airport to check on the cat. Well, as soon as his brother answered the phone, he said, your cat died. His brother said, there was no need for you to be so blunt. Mr. Myrick was inconsolable. His grief was magnified by his brother's insensitivity. So after they hung up, he sat there for a little while, and he called again to express his pain. He said, again, there's no need for you to be so blunt. Well, what was I supposed to say? His perplexed brother asked. He said, you you could have broken the news gradually. You could have said the cat was playing on the roof. And then later in the conversation, you could have said he fell off. And then you could have said he broke his leg. And then when I came to pick him up, you could have said, I'm so sorry, your cat passed away during the night. You've got to learn to be more tactful than that. And by the way, how's mom? Well, she's up on the roof. (laughs) Sometimes it's the timing that makes the words hurt. In this verse, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, you can easily see things escalating because someone thought he just had to say it because of what the other person was saying. We wouldn't want it to look like we've lost 
We wouldn't want it to look like we're wrong, so we have to say it. And we have to say it right now. Why will we stoop so low sometimes when we see that, that these words in Proverbs 51 are such honorable truth? Well, here's one big reason. Proverbs 29, verse 23 says, One's pride will bring him low, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. It takes a little bit of time to, to swallow pride. We've got to get this out just as fast as we can, we think. Maybe it's something that could have waited until a calmer time Maybe it's something that just should have been left in the past. And we're bringing up old stuff in response to new stuff. What if you could go back to a specific moment in time with absolute commitment to the truth of Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1? You know that a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Do you, do you see some point in time with somebody where if you would have gone about it the right way according to this verse, things wouldn't be the way they are even today? We can't go back in time. If that person is still around, you can't apologize. And that's where to begin. And then a big first step for any of us who want to be more like Jesus is to aim at eliminating harsh words from our interactions. But we can do even better. Let's think about soft answers for a little while. If pride is one of the big problems, one of the big causes of this symptom of harsh words, then we ought to understand that habitually gentle words come from a genuinely humble heart. Habitually gentle words come from a genuinely humble heart. We can think again in terms of the terms that we would use. If we would choose our words more carefully, we might disarm even the most verbally violent people that we know. When uh, Hall of Famer Wade Boggs played for the Boston Red Sox, he hated playing at Yankee Stadium. That wasn't because of the Yankee players. They were all pretty nice to him. But there was this one fan who had a box seat not far from third base where he played. And one fan made Yankee Stadium miserable for Wade Boggs. One day before the game, as Boggs was warming up, that fan began his typical routine yelling, Hey, Boggs, you stink! and variations on that theme then. Well, Boggs decided he had had enough. He walked over directly to the man who was sitting in the stands with his friends and said, Hey, fella, are you the guy that's always yelling at me? Yes, I am. What are you going to do about it? Well, Wade took a new baseball out of his pocket. He autographed it, handed it to the man, Never heard any words like that again. Even while he was a Boston Red Sox, he became a Yankee later on. And that guy became one of his biggest fans. The soft words sometimes are going to be just choosing the right thing to say. Sometimes, again, it's going to be our tone. Now, thinking back to what it said about Jesus in 1 Peter 2, when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. How hard is it not to yell when somebody's yelling at you? How hard is it not to be sharp when somebody is being sharp with you? Naturally, it's almost inevitable that you're going to respond with the same kind of thing that's being offered 
to you. But when we speak softly, on the other hand, it's much harder for people to yell at us. It's amazing how much control we have over each other in situations like that. So if we could just learn to control ourselves, to be self-controlled with our words. Sometimes when you tone it down, you'll not only accomplish something constructive with the other person, but also turn away your own anger. Proverbs chapter 17, verse 27, the Bible says, Whoever restrains his words has knowledge, and he who has a cool spirit is a man of understanding. Now, I've already quoted the first half of Proverbs chapter 12, verse 18, but now listen to the whole thing. It says, There is one whose words are rash like sword thrusts, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. In Proverbs chapter 15, still in our same chapter, verse 28, the Bible says, The heart of the righteous ponders how to answer, but the mouth of the wicked pours out evil things. In chapter 15, verse 23 says, To make an apt answer is a joy to a man, and a word in season, how good it is. I remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount about about turning the other cheek, about loving your enemies, and about being peacemakers. Remember Matthew 5, 9? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. I've not let the PowerPoint catch up here, but in in a lot of this we're talking about timing, aren't we? A word in season, the one verse said from Proverbs. Why don't, as we try to wrap this up, you read one more passage with me from James chapter 3 this time. James chapter 3. This chapter, better than any other in the Bible is known for the warning it gives to us about being careful with our tongues, being careful with our words, what we say. And I'm not going to rehearse uh, verses 1 through 12, which are specifically about the tongue, but I want you to be sure you hear what James says to wrap it up and be an inspiration at the end of chapter 3. Verses 13 through 18. Who's wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. James has said the the tongue is untamable. The tongue is a fire, and it sets the whole world on fire. You can do something about it. But the thing that's going to help you do something about it, James says, comes from above, and it comes from deep within. Here's a wise and understanding person. The one who wants peace. He's not selfishly ambitious. He's not jealous. He's pure and peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. That's the kind of person who can continually give soft answers that turn away wrath. Now, is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, a proverb or a promise? I'm going to back that up so you're not looking at it right now. Is Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1, a proverb or a promise? It's a proverb. It's, It's not a promise. 
A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, you know you have been in situations where it did not work that way. Why? Because there are some people who are so angry, it doesn't matter what you say or how you say it, they're going to be mad. And then on the other side... There are some people who just aren't going to get mad. They're that way. But when you get out into life, you will find that this is generally the truth. And so a careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word may lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. Talk this way. Soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Let's finish right where we started with Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 2. Jesus always got this and everything else right. Then he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you are healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Jesus died so that you could be forgiven of all these things you've said that you shouldn't have said and everything else that's been wrong in your life. How important is that? Well, in Matthew chapter 12, verses 36 and 37, Jesus said that we better be careful with our words because on the day of judgment, we're going to give an account for every careless word. He died for our sins. He died to forgive us. But 1 Peter 2.24 says, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Are you willing to put this trash behind you? He just wants you to die to sin. He wants you to live to righteousness. Are, are you willing to adopt the kind of vocabulary in a time of tone, in a time of demeanor. He says, I want to be righteous. You need to return to Jesus, the shepherd and overseer of your soul. This morning, you can become a Christian. Your sins can be washed away if you believe that Jesus is the Christ who bore his, your sins and his body on the tree rose from the dead. If you'll turn away from sin and repent and confess your faith in him, you can be baptized this morning. Your sins will be washed away by His blood. But then live righteously. Is that the way you're living, fellow Christian? Your mouth got in the way? Something else got in the way? Would you like us to pray with you about that this morning? God wants to forgive you. He wants things to be right. We're singing an invitation song for you to respond publicly with that to me. Why don't you come while we stand and sing?